get about four or five hundred live and Hello everyone. Welcome to Practical Talks for Family Docs, the College of Family Physicians of Canada's live clinical webinar series. My name is Jeff Sisler. I'm a family doctor here in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and I'm an executive director at the CFPC. My pleasure to act as the moderator of today's webinar. I'm a paid employee of the CFPC and I have no other conflicts to declare. You know, there's really no topic today more important than this one for family physicians across our country and indeed for all Canadians rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines across Canada. And there's certainly no topic that is evolving more quickly. So that's what we're gonna be tackling today with our three panelists. But before we get going, I would like to acknowledge that the lands on which we're hosting this meeting include the traditional territories of many nations. The CFPC recognizes the many injustices experienced by the indigenous peoples of Canada and that continue to affect their health and well-being. The college respects that Indigenous people have rich cultural and traditional practices that have been known to uh, improve important health outcomes. I all attendees to reflect on the territories that you're calling in from right now. Share it in our chat and let's commit ourselves to gaining knowledge, forging a new culturally safe relationship and contributing to reconciliation. Well, if you're watching this live on YouTube, um, please submit your questions in the chat window by logging into your own Google or your own YouTube account. If you can't see that chat window, it may be because you're in full screen mode. Send along your questions and we're gonna be addressing them uh, in the last 15 to 20 minutes of the webinar today. Let's keep the chat lively, fun, and respectful. If you're watching this now live as a webcast, it's eligible for one main pro plus uh, credit. And in order to claim your credit, you're going to need to complete a short registration survey or form. And the link for that, as those of you who've been on these webinars before will know, that link will be posted as we get further into the webinar. 
and you're going to need to complete that survey for your credit before the end of the day, Friday of this week. So again, watch for that link later in the webinar to claim your main pro plus credits for this um, webinar. So we have a panel of three physicians joining us today, and I'm going to provide a short introduction for each of them, and then I'll ask them to say hello and to present their conflict of interest statement. A familiar face to all of us is Dr. Isaac Bogosh, who's an assistant professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Medicine and an infectious diseases specialist at Toronto General Hospital. Isaac is active uh, provincially, nationally, and internationally in the work addressing COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Bogosh, can you say hi to our audience and review your COI, please? Hey, everyone. Lovely to chat today. I consult to a company called Blue Dot, and that tracks the spread of emerging infectious diseases. Thanks very much. Uh, second panelist today is Dr. Jen Potter. Jen's an assistant professor at the University of Manitoba in the Department of Family Medicine. She practices family medicine at a teaching clinic at Seven Oaks Hospital in Winnipeg. She is a member of the peer group and has a research interest in vaccine hesitancy. Dr. Potter, can you say hi and review your COI, please? Hi, uh, yeah, my, uh, my COIs would be that I've received a uh, speaker honoraria from Doctors Manitoba and I've done some uh, content review for the CFPC's e-learning modules. Thank you. And our third panelist is Dr. Morgan Price. Morgan is an associate professor at the University of British Columbia with the Department of Family Practice, working in the Island Medical Program. He's an associate head of that department at UBC, and is actively involved in developing tools and methods to support team-based care as part of the BC Primary Care Innovation Support Unit, of which he is the founding director. Morgan practices family medicine in the inner city with underserviced populations in Victoria. So Dr. Price, can you say hi to our audience and review your COI, please? Yes, uh, hello everyone, and, and thank you. I'm excited to be here today. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that our Innovation Support Unit has received funding from the BC Ministry of Health. Thanks very much. Let's review the learning objectives for our webinar today. So by the end of our, of our session, we hope that you'll be able to examine the current rollout of the COVID-19 vaccination across Canada, to interpret updated information about the vaccines, including mechanism of action, efficacy, and safety, identify strategies to combat vaccine hesitancy, and lastly, to recognize the role that Canadian family physicians are playing in the vaccine rollout and the challenges that are being encountered. So with that, uh, we can get going with our questions for our panelists. And again, thanks to all three of you for spending the time this afternoon and being in this large community of Canadian family docs gathering more or less over the lunch hour. Um, and I'm going to start with my first question to Dr. Bog Bogosh. A um, couple of questions uh, that hopefully you'll be able to help us with. Uh, first of all, can you just review again briefly the, the basic differences in the mechanism of actions of the well, of the, M the messenger RNA vaccines and the viral vector vaccines that uh, are now on the market in Canada? Yeah, uh, great question. And I think this comes up a lot. If just putting it uh, flatly, you've got sort of those two big categories, right? You've got your mRNA vaccines and then, and then you've got your viral vector vaccines. The mRNA vaccines are pretty incredible. You've got a bit of mRNA that's really coated in salts, sugars, fats to keep it all together. Uh, injected into the deltoid like everything else. And then essentially, um, the mRNA really just codes for, or it tells your cells to produce um, a, a component of the spike protein. That's it, it's brilliant. And then it, and then it evaporates. So your, uh, your, your host cells are gonna make um, uh, antibodies that, uh, or your host cells are gonna make something, a protein that resembles the spike protein. And then your body's gonna say, yeah, that doesn't belong here and make antibodies against it. Um, very, very smart method of vaccine uh, delivery. And, and uh, you know, I think we're going to see a lot of mRNA vaccines in the near horizon, not to get too far off topic, but they're already starting to use these platforms to look at tackling other infections, for example, malaria. Viral vectors are, are, are also pretty interesting. Uh, they've been around for a, a bit longer and we've used them with, with other vaccines. But for example, you've got your AstraZeneca's, um, and essentially, they use uh, um, a, a viral platform to bring in a uh, component that will trick your body to create spike protein 
uh, antibodies as well. So you're just, uh, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, a lot of this, you know, they get to the same outcome through, through slightly different paths. Uh, the outcome is that they're all really coding for a spike protein. And ultimately, uh, there's a lot of convergence because all the vaccines will really create antibodies towards the spike protein component of the virus. So uh, one does it by delivering mRNA, one sort of sneaks that code for the spike protein in a, in a viral vector. These are not live viruses. They cannot replicate. They cannot cause infection. I think that comes up from time to time. So it's a viral vector, but it, there's no potential for further replication in the human host. Um, but at the end of the day, all of those paths lead to us creating antibodies toward uh, spike protein. Thanks, Isaac. Uh, just to follow up, there's obviously been ongoing discussion about the relative efficacy of our vaccine choices present and to come in Canada. Um, most of the concerns have been focused on the AstraZeneca vaccine in particular, based, I think, in particular on the original licensing data that uh, was shared and maybe some more recent information. So uh, can you just summarize where you think we're at right now in terms of this issue of the, um, the relative efficacy of these vaccine choices that that we have as Canadians? Absolutely, that's a great question because it comes up all the time. I think there's a few things to remember. One is that the mRNA vaccines, like your, your Pfizer's and the Moderna's, were really tested in a period of time where there were very few circulating variants of concern. Whereas your other ones, your AstraZeneca's, your Johnson & Johnson's, your Novavax's, those were tested in an era where there was a lot more circulating variants of concern. So when you see these AstraZeneca and Pfizer efficacies compared to your, um, sorry, when you see your, your Moderna and Pfizer efficacies compared to your AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson efficacies, you know, that, that delta is probably a little bit smaller than what the efficacies suggest in the clinical trials just because of the circulating variants of concern at that time. Having said that, I still think it's important to recognize that some vaccines are, are probably going to be better than others. Like if there is ever a head to head, we'll probably see that some are more protective than others. And I think we have to acknowledge that. I think there's other interesting work as well that we should acknowledge, which is outside of the clinical trials, looking at real world data, real world data. And if you look at some of the real world data, you ever want to say, well, which one's better? Which one's better? If you look at the real world data, for example, from Scotland, obviously it's imperfect. It's not a clinical trial. It's real world data. But if you really want to get picky, the AstraZeneca vaccine sort of non-significantly, but kind of maybe sort of outperformed the Pfizer vaccine after, uh, you know, after one dose. So, you know, I think, I think it's fair to say that, sure, at the end of the day, we'll probably find that some vaccines will provide better protection than others, and we should be acknowledging that. But the direct head-to-head -head comparison of these vaccines is very challenging and fraught with error because they were tested in different populations at different times. And then I think we also, this might come up later, but let's also frame it in, in where we're at right now in Canada. So in March and April, for example, of 2021, many parts of the country are in a third wave. All of the vaccines, regardless of what the efficacy was in the clinical trial, all of the vaccines provide you with very, very, very good protection against getting COVID-19. And if you're unlucky enough to get COVID-19, all of the available vaccines provide significant protection against hospitalization and death. So, you know, sometimes we'll get these questions of like, well, I'm going to hold off for this one, or I'm going to wait for that one. And, and we might address that later on. But really, if you look at any of the vaccines available in Canada right now, they all do what you want them to do. They all reduce your risk of getting the infection, and they all reduce your risk of having a severe outcome and dying. Pretty important metric. So I think any of the vaccines are, are actually quite, <laughs> quite good, and I take any of them. Great. Thanks a lot. I'm going to turn a question over to Morgan Price at this point. And Morgan, it's about the rollout that's happening coast to coast of, of these vaccines. Um, I think we're all aware of the interprovincial comparisons going on almost obsessively between citizens and perhaps premiers as well in public health officers as they make different decisions around prioritizing how vaccines will be rolled out in their particular populations. Um, so just wondering what your comments are about that. You know, is there a set formula that provinces really should be following or is it is it fair to see a strong emphasis on local context in those in those provincial decisions? Um, Ed, Jeff, it's a it's a great question. I think uh, principles are really important to follow, and then the, as you said, the context becomes relevant. Um, and and at the end of the day, 
uh, you know, it's the it's the the number of shots in the arm that I think are really the the the, the goal. So whatever the context is to make it um, faster is a is a better choice. Thinking about mortality as a principle, trying to hit those at highest risk for mortality, so that we bend that curve down. And then on the on the flip side of that, those who are at higher risk for either catching or um, spreading uh, COVID uh, to to bring that curve down. I think both of those things are really important. And then I, I know I know that provinces have to overlay on top of that this whole feasibility component to it. And that, as a family doctor, sometimes it's hard to think about within my own practice uh, the feasibility of then scaling it up to a region or to a province. And you have to make some very broad stroke decisions about, well, you know, the, the risk by age category, we can do it in chunks of five years or 10 years, um, or we can do it in a, in a particular location in rural remote and we can get the entire population done because it's feasible to get up there once, twice for the second dose, but not every two weeks for a different five year tranche of a few people. So I think the, the provinces have a tough, tough go at adapting that um, feasibility side. Uh, and that's where I think we see some of the differences. And the last piece of context that even within a province or, you know, with, within a region um, is the, the relative, uh, the, the prevalence of, of the uh, infection. And we're in a little bit of a bubble on the island here in Victoria and, and actually across the island compared to most of the rest of North America. And so I would imagine that there is, and we're seeing it with public health that in the hotspots in BC, we're getting earlier and more doses of vaccine in those places. And that makes sense. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, comments from any other panelists on that question about interprovincial decisions around vaccine rollout? I would just say that that I don't know that there's really an optimal way to do it, and I think a lot of it depends on the local context. And and you know, like Morgan said, uh, you know, rural is different than urban, and and you know, islands are different than mainland. And so I I, I think there's a lot of ways to just get it done, and and it's. You know, if, if vaccines are going in, going into arms, then that's really what we're trying to do. So just get it done. I'm with Dr. Potter and Dr. Price on this as well. I think there's a lot of right ways to do it. As long as it's viewed with the lens of equity and data, then we're doing something right. Mm -hmm. But there's lots of right paths. Um, clearly, you've got to protect those at risk of death. You've also got to protect those who are at risk of getting this infection by virtue of their their work you know essential workers and of course you've got to protect um you know risk of death is different right it's not just it's not just age it's also medical comorbidities it's also not ignoring the social determinants of health and recognizing that the risk of death in a 50 year old in certain postal codes will be the same as the risk of death as an 80 year old in other postal codes so easy to say equity and data a lot harder to implement yeah and just to, to build off of that, Isaac, uh, I think the, the provincial level can be very sort of blunt and bringing that, that community context up, there, there needs to be a good way to engage the community to think about um, not only who, but where, uh, what's an acceptable location for a vaccine clinic, uh, you know, does it need to be mobile versus a single location, et cetera. Those things I think are really important to bring into that, that equity lens. I totally agree, and, and, that, and that's how you would build equity into a program. I just I know not to belabor the point, but if you look at the example in Ontario, and I'm not trying to pat anyone, myself included, on the back, but like you look at you know, patting the public health units on the back in Ontario, like there are very strategically placed vaccine centers, and there are very strategically placed community centers, not mass vaccine clinics, but community centers, because we know some communities. Are, you know, because of years of neglect and abuse are just not trusting of the government or the or the uh, medical system. Mm -hmm. um, you look at, you wanna see a gaff, look at the uh, map of pharmacies providing the vaccinations in the greater Toronto area. And this huge area devoid of pharmacies providing that in a, a heavily impacted area of Northwest Toronto, which is rapidly being corrected. So that, that but like, that's a mistake and that's being fixed net rapidly. So it's not perfect. And, and it's one thing to talk the talk, but it's another thing to actually do it. And, 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 and Dr. Price points out too, you know, mobile clinics, right? We know mobile clinics could be very helpful. So I think this is obviously, there's a lot of ways to build equity into, into this. And, uh, and we, we should be open-minded to, to multiple different mechanisms of that. Uh, 
Thanks for those comments. Uh, let's talk a bit more about vaccine hesitancy. Isaac has alluded to the fact that there are special, you know, there are populations of Canadians that may be particularly hesitant. But Jen, I know this is a topic of interest for you, and I'm just wondering how you think we best target our efforts, given the fact that we know there is a chunk of Canadians that are not really sure about this. Um, what I've read is that you know there are obviously folks that are eager to be vaccinated. There are folks that are definitely not going to be vaccinated, and then that group in the middle that's um, hesitant. Um, can you can you talk about those three groups a bit? And I'm presuming that that middle group is probably going to be our particular focus as family physicians as we have these conversations. Yeah, I mean, there's really a lot of nuance in that middle group there. There's sort of the, you know, vaccine hesitancy is a spectrum. And at one end of the spectrum, you have people who really just, you know, they, they don't really have any questions. They're just going to take the vaccine. Uh, for that group of people, I mean, that's relatively easy. They're already kind of doing the desired behavior. We What we really just have to do is maintain that confidence that they have. For the group at the other extreme, where where you know they don't, uh, they're they're not interested in, in even engaging on vaccines. They've made up their mind that they're not going to get it. Um, that's very very challenging because it often comes into sort of identity and worldview issues and things like that. And uh, and we really don't have a great evidence based way of of um, of engaging with those people other than just to try and keep the conversation going as best you can and, and maintain trust. And then it's that group in the middle, the vaccine hesitant. And, and that really can range. That can range from, I'm pretty sure I want the vaccine, but I do have some questions to, you know, I want the vaccine, but I'm not sure this is the right thing to, you know, I will take the vaccine, but I'm going to maybe do a delayed schedule or I'm going to, you know, maybe take some vaccines, but not other vaccines, that sort of thing. So there really is a range there. And I think, um, if there's sort of one take home message to, you know, to dealing with all of those people is really try to meet them where they're at and try and understand what their concerns are and address those concerns mm -hmm. and then spend most of your time focusing on the benefits of protection and, you know, the benefits of, of any vaccine and, uh, and, you know, not having to, to, or being a lot less worried about, you know, having to, to, to get really sick with COVID. So I think, I think those are sort of the principles that I, I would, I would emphasize there is is maintain the trust, maintain the relationship, um, and then try and uh, um, try and and just meet people where they're at and and uh, address their specific concerns. And Jen, if I could just follow up, are there particular ways of expressing this with patients that are significantly uncertain? Ways that you you open the conversation or frame your interest in their being uh, vaccinated or immunized because. It feels like that's finding the right words does feel like a challenge because I think we feel anxious sometimes in those conversations. Yeah, I'm, I would say a fair amount of those conversations can be the patient telling you what they think. Um, it, it sort of helps you to understand and get a picture of, of where they're coming from. Um, there, the few things that are, are, are fairly you know, right, rooted in evidence would be to make a strong recommendation to get a vaccine to keep the conversation going, uh, you know, so it's not just a one and done conversation. Um, and then the other thing is, is to really focus on the benefits to them as an individual, not so much the benefits to society, not so much, you know, trying, you know, scare, trying to scare them into, you know, into things and, and, and dispelling misconceptions, but really focusing on, you know, the benefits of being protected uh, against COVID or, or whatever else you're vaccinating against. Um, the most, um, the most commonly recommended approach would be like a motivational interviewing approach where you sort of start off by asking, you know, what have you heard? Uh, what concerns you about vaccines? Then you kind of affirm it, you reflect it back to them so they know they've been heard. Um, if they have some misconceptions, it's okay to, to engage on those a little bit, but you don't want to spend a lot of time on that. Um, and you really want to avoid like, that's not true. You, you don't want to set up that sort of cognitive dissonance where where people are going to um, have to feel like they have to dig their heels in because you know you're challenging their their beliefs so you you don't really want to spend a lot of time on on misconceptions and and that but you really want to sort of pivot back to okay let's focus on benefits and let's focus on you know the the, the really sp strong reasons it would be I'm really personally recommending this vaccine for you as an individual Thanks, Jennifer. Any other comments? We've all had these discussions. They're very common these days. Any other pearls around those conversations with hesitant uh, 
patients? Uh, I, I've got two thoughts. One is that I'm probably not, I wasn't having it as much as I should have initially because people who were who were keen to get the vaccine were asking me and those who weren't keen weren't. And it was almost like a, a, a reprieve. It's like, oh, I, I can deal with non-COVID stuff today with this. But actually that's the person that I probably should have been proactive with. That was one of the my own personal takeaways. The other one that I like, it, it builds on the motivational interviewing, is asking a confidence scale, one to 10, what's your likelihood of getting it? And even if it's a really low number, then ask why isn't it lower? So what's the reason it's a three out of 10 as opposed to, don't say why isn't it an eight? Why, why is it a three? What, what brought it up that high? And then you can focus on that. What are the positives out of that three of 10? And that, that like Jen says, flips the conversation to the positive reasons as opposed to trying to dispel a myth which can get people defensive. Isaac, any comments on that? I was going to say, I have nothing to add. I'm learning a lot from this, and I'm going to take some of these tools and integrate it into my practice. <laughs> so this is great for me. Picking up on Morgan's comment, you know, that sounds like a solution-focused counseling technique. And if it's a three, then the question can also be, what would it take for it to be a four or a five? And what would you need to know or, or be reassured about to be more confident? So um, yeah, it's interesting. Well, why don't we head back to Isaac for a couple other questions at this point. And Isaac, I wanted to focus on the recent shift that we've seen in many provinces to an extension of the second dose from several weeks to four months is now the common measure. And I'm just wondering what, uh, how, how you can explain the evidence behind that decision and uh, the impact that it may be having in terms of the role of the vaccine. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a big challenge. And quite frankly, I, I can't. I mean, I think if we were asking the question in December of, 2020, we were asking, you know, can we stretch out the doses of these vaccines, in particular the, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine? And the answer was, well, we're not sure, maybe, maybe not. Now the question is, okay, there's data saying you can stretch them out. How far can you stretch out the doses of these? Uh, what, what's an acceptable uh, duration of time between dose one and dose two? And if we really sort of look under the hood and look at some of the evidence for this, I think it's fair to say that there's decent evidence to stretch these out to two months. Um, you can probably look at the UK and some data emerging from the UK and stretch them out to three months. I got to say, though, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not part of NACI. I won't speak on NACI's behalf, but um, I think it's fair to say that there, there's limited data to stretch it out to four months. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that there's, we're, we're in a bit of a data-free zone or a, a zone with much, much, much less data. What do we do with this? Well, it's, there's also emerging data demonstrating that stretching out the doses uh, and stretching out that second dose might not be a good idea for certain populations. If we look at, uh, for example, older populations, especially those uh, over the age of 80, if we look at people who have cancer, if we look at people who have organ transplants, it doesn't appear that they mount the same degree of an immune response following the first dose of a vaccine. There's a caveat. Obviously, these are we're looking at surrogate markers like you know antibody titers and, and, and stuff, and we're not necessarily looking at infection. But I think there are arrows pointing in the direction that you you, you should, probably shouldn't be stretching out that second dose in certain populations. I don't have a crystal ball, but and, and, and clearly policy and data is changing quickly. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see either NACI or certain provinces or many provinces say, you know what, we're, we're not going to stretch the doses out that far for select populations, including those who are at greatest risk of having a severe outcome. I wouldn't be surprised if we see that. I still firmly believe that it is okay for the vast majority of people to stretch those doses out. I think that really confers significant protection over a much larger proportion of your population. And if you watch that strategy unfold in real time, like in a place like the United Kingdom, it is working very, very, very well. But, you know, it might be prudent to take a more modified approach and, uh, and stretch the doses out. I'm just going to say a number like three months, maybe even four months with, very, with younger populations. But, uh, but with those who are at greatest risk of not mounting uh, a robust immune response to staying closer to the dosing schedule that was done in the clinical trials. Mm. Any other comments on that question? No? 
Maybe I'll just pick up on the issue of like patient choice and agency. Uh, Jen was alluding obviously to the fact that people do have to agree to be back, to be immunized. And we know that the other thing emerging, maybe because of the concerns of the AstraZeneca vaccine in particular is the question about to what extent patients have or should have the uh, right or be counseled to, to um, well, sh should, they, should they have the right of choice in a sense about available vaccines, especially when when they may become more available for all, which isn't probably quite the case yet. So just, I'd, I'd be welcome, welcome, maybe Morgan, I'll ask you to kick it off. Just your thoughts about the extent to which um, we should be um, giving Canadians a choice of vaccine when that's appropriate. Yeah, you know, it it is, it's a good question. And I think it partly because of all the, all the real time news that we've been getting, uh, you know, I think I, a lot of my, most up-to-date stuff has come from the news, not not the journals, um, that we're aware of these different vaccines even. I, I think if you were to ask anybody about any other vaccine, do people know the brands? Um, so I think there's there's that question. Where there's a lot of knowledge out there in, in the public space. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but then to interpret that, uh, I think at the end of the day, for me, <clears throat> waiting a few months to get the the posh vaccine or the one you think is slightly better, um, the risk of those two months, especially now, especially as we're starting to get this um, this uh, next wave, it, it doesn't make any sense. I, I think I encourage people to get whichever's available. I would take whichever's available. And, um, you know, as we said earlier, that we might find some differences later, but it's it's way better to have the vaccine now than, than two to six months later. And Isaac, you've spoken to this already, but I've really obviously raised the question about whether these differences that we think are there really are what we think they are. So there's um, an element of uh, yeah. uh, confusion there. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I'm with Dr. Price on this, right? Like <laughs> many parts of the country are in a third wave. We know who gets infected and where they get infected. We know that, for example, people 60 years and up account for over 90% of the deaths we've seen in Canada. They're overwhelmingly represented or overrepresented in, in hospitalizations and ICU stays. Like there's no reason for that to happen because someone is waiting. You know, you've got vaccine A available, but someone's waiting for vaccine B. Like there's no reason for that mm -hmm. to happen. Like we can't let that happen. And, uh, you know, I think we obviously need clear, consistent, messaging we need honest and transparent messaging that's that's aligned with science and and the utmost up-to-date data at the time um you know certainly it hasn't helped i know we're basically talking around saying the word astrazeneca but really we're all referring to astrazeneca <laughs> and, you know it's yeah. the the you know it's been tough right the company hasn't done a good job in the sense that you know their first clinical trial was rather sloppy right they had a dosing error and different doses in different countries and they sort of smushed that all together to make a clinical trial like that was that didn't do them any favors then you have some countries saying we're going to give it to over 65 other countries saying not over 65 then countries pivoting and giving it over to 65 again you can keep up to date in real time with that but the messaging has to be on point now you have some rare 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 um uh, blood clotting events associated or potentially associated with the vaccine can't ignore it. You absolutely can't ignore it. You can't sweep it under the rug. You've got to address it. Uh, but that's not helping. And then, of course, you've got their clinical trial results that came out yesterday showing 79% efficacy in a press release of interim results. Okay, press release caveat, interim results caveat. 79% efficacy is great, um, uh, especially in the era of variants of concern. But then, of course, you have today the Data Safety Monitoring Board comes out and says, hold your horses. They might not be showing all the data. Like, there's so many things that are preventable that could have been avoided that are really eroding public trust. There's certain things that aren't preventable, right? Like, there's only, you know, this blood clotting. You're only going to see that when you give this to millions and millions and millions and millions of people. These are such rare events that you're probably not going to find any signal in large phase three clinical trials. But there are certain gaps that are communication gaps that are totally preventable that, you uh, we just have to call it how it is. It has eroded some public trust in the vaccine. Based on what we know today, you know, 12.33 p.m. on March 23rd, <laughs> I think it's a good vaccine. I think it should be rolled out. I think it's a very reasonable product, especially for people 60 years of age and up. Um, 
you know, can we always change our mind based on emerging data? Of course we can. But based on what we know now, I think this is still a really good product. And I really hope people take the opportunity to get this vaccine because it, it truly can save your life. Can you talk a bit more about the thrombosis question? That is obviously the topic of the day. And how would you, and I'll ask Isaac first, but others as well, how, do you, how would you put that rare risk of significant thrombosis in context? Because that is grabbing headlines, obviously. Yeah, I think there's a few points there. One is that not all blood clots are created the same way, right? There is, there is a basal rate of different blood clotting events in, in you know, various populations. What we're really talking about here is um, a, a heparin-induced thrombocytopenia-like syndrome, right? Thrombocytopenia and blood clotting events, and not just regular run-of-the-mill blood clots like we see DVTs and PEs, but blood clots in places where we don't frequently see blood clots like sinus venous thromboses like those are rare you know so when you start to see that however rare it may be you still you, you can't ignore it right you've got to take it seriously you can't ignore it and i don't think this chapter is fully written having said that let's put it in the appropriate context it's clearly a very rare event can i look you in the eye and tell you right this minute how rare it is no but it's clearly a rare event because we've seen like tens and tens of millions of doses of this vaccine administered. We also know that the, um, you know, the infection itself provides a prothrombotic, uh, is a prothrombotic state and there are blood clots associated with it. And I think we can think about, you know, the risk, obviously the risks of the vaccine versus the risks of not vaccinating, especially in the context of a third wave, especially in the context that we're vaccinating people, most of the parts of the country, 60 years of, of age and up, we're at significant risk of severe outcomes with this infection. Based on where we're at now in the country and what we know, I think it's a very reasonable thing to, to continue with this vaccine. Um, but of course, I also think it's in the same breath, we cannot ignore those thrombotic events. It has to be evaluated, monitored closely. I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball, but you know, if there is a need to pivot later on, then let's pivot later on. If there's a need to say we want to use it in these populations and we're going to avoid it in those populations, great, let's, let's just do it. But um, you know, based on what we know now, I think it's still a very good vaccine. And you know, I, I've been recommending it to you know, for example, family and friends and, and colleagues and, and patients and, and stuff. And I'll continue to do so until I see evidence to the contrary, which I, I don't see just yet. Yeah. Thanks, Morgan Price. I wanted to go back to you with regards to the roles that family docs across the country are playing in the vaccine rollout. Um, I think we're seeing mobilization around this um, urgent public need, and I'm just wondering what you think family docs need to be effective uh, in playing a part in this this enterprise. Yeah, I think I think we have a, a unique and, and important role to play. There's a there's about for four or five different areas that I think are, are important. We we have sort of for disclosure, one of the things we've done in the innovation support unit is is we've been building a primary care COVID immunization toolkit. And it's at covidtoolkit.ca. So just to plug that for a second. But we've structured it in in the following way. So first there's that identifying and engaging of patients. Even if you're not giving vaccine yourself, that's the stuff we're doing today. We're having these conversations. We're talking about vaccine hesitancy, but we also have the ability to, to flag those who are at higher risk that we really want to target to get vaccine, either early within an eligible cohort or as the new cohorts change um, in different phases in the different provinces. Mm -hmm. So there's that part I think is critical for us. Uh, we've talked about vaccine hesitancy and building off of our relationships that we have, et cetera. I think that's, that's key. Um, then if we are going to be able to give vaccine in our offices, uh, you know, we have a whole process of planning and figuring out how many patients you can book per day, et cetera, for vaccines. And that, that there's tools in the toolkit to help calculators and things like that that you can use uh, to actually do the running of the clinic, the planning and running of the clinic. And then there's the follow-up. So even if, again, if you're not vaccinating, the follow-up is important because people are going to call us and say, I just got my vaccine and my arm's really sore and I'm feeling kind of sick. And do you think I have COVID? Um, and those who didn't get the vaccine, who declined, we're going to need to follow up with them as well. So I think there's all of those uh, follow-up components that are going to be critical for us. And we know who our patients are, so we can advocate on the front end and, and advocate afterwards as well. And then the, the other role we can have, and in BC, this is one of the roles that is, that's being um, encouraged, is to be the people that give the vaccine. So to go to the larger 
massive vaccination clinics and uh, uh, do some shifts and, and give some vaccine. And I think that that's an important piece too. Uh, it doesn't feel quite as emotionally satisfying if it's not our own patients, I think, but it is also an important role. Thanks. Uh, Jen, do you want to add to that from the Manitoba perspective? Um, well, I would I would echo what Dr. Price said in in uh, in the emphasizing that um, you know the relationship that we already have with our patients is is key um, because one of the things we do know is that a strong recommendation from a trusted healthcare provider actually goes a long way in encouraging people to to get the vaccine. So I think that's uh, from a vaccine hesitancy point of view. I think that um, you know particularly the people who are on the fence a little bit, um, but you know, if if the right person says, "Hey, I think this is a good idea," then uh, then that's a, a really important role that the family doc can play. Um, and then the other thing is is I think expressing confidence overall in the va in vaccination in general and the COVID vaccines that are available, um, and you know, being out there and 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 like you said, uh, giving the vaccines and everything like that, like. And you know, talking about like you know, I I'm I want my family to get this, and and you know that also uh, is something that people really hear and really um, really take to heart. So you know, sort of being visible, uh, being proactive about it, and being um, you know be, being really um, engaged in 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 using that trust uh, that trust relationship that you already have uh, is is some of the things that that we need to do. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to turn to a couple of audience questions now, just uh, to change uh, course a little bit. Um, uh, Dr. Bogosh, there's a question about the, um, well, the question is what, are there other viral vector vaccination, vaccines on the market or coming to market besides the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that you're aware of? Oh, you know what, in all fairness, I'm not really paying attention to many of the phase two clinical trials right now. My bad. I should be looking at them. I just don't know um, what's really in the pipeline. Unfortunately, I, I I haven't been really paying attention to that. I've been mostly focusing on the ones that have been licensed in Canada, yeah. trying to get them out as quickly as possible. So I can't yeah. answer that question so well. I'm sorry. How about allergies? I, I know that there was early on some concern about you know a few episodes of anaphylaxis. My sense is that that concern is damped down. But how do we counsel patients? that have a history of, I guess, food or, or, or the common allergies that Canadians have? Great question. And in fact, we, we there is good data available demonstrating that severe allergic reactions are extremely rare. When they do occur, it's usually to a component of the vaccine called PEG. In fact, all of this is, is beautifully available on the Public Health Agency of Canada's website. You can see every single ingredient of the vaccines. And to no one's surprise, there's, there's actually not much there. Uh, but uh, there have been a very, very small handful of allergies related probably to that component, which is in, uh, the, uh, which is in the vaccines. Um, again, I, I counsel people and I say that, you know, you might have a severe allergy to shellfish or to pollen or whatever, but, but that, that it's not a, a PEG related allergy and, and they can get the vaccine. In fact, there's only been, well, personally, I haven't had anyone uh, with allergy issues uh, who I've said you should not get this vaccine. I've anecdotally heard of one person in Canada. There, of course, are, I'm sure are others, but um, this, this obviously comes up a lot in conversation, but it, it just, it doesn't really bear out. I think the other important thing to remember, too, is to counsel people that every vaccine center is equipped to deal with a severe allergy if on the very, very rare opportunity it occurs, they have the medical expertise and the equipment there to deal with it. There's been no deaths to date. And, and, and quite frankly, it's, it's rare. And then lastly, I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but there was an article in uh, JAMA recently um, demonstrating like something like, was it two per million or something like that for the Moderna vaccine? I just don't remember what the Pfizer was, but like these are really, really rare events. Yeah. Question I'd like to put me probably to you as well as from Peter. And here's the question. Is data on the prevention of asymptomatic infection, not symptomatic, but asymptomatic, is it there for the Pfizer and Moderna uh, vaccines from the from the trials, from the published studies? And if not, is there data that we can be expecting around prevention of, I guess, asymptomatic disease? I presume that relates then to the possibility of passing it on, even though you're not sick yourself. 
Yeah, I think there's two ways to address this question. One is there is emerging real world data for asymptomatic disease where, for example, they just swabbed people very, very regularly after they had the vaccine. And, uh, and you know, it, it, uh, it certainly does reduce your risk of infection. This was from data from Israel. In addition to that, um, it does appear to attenuate the uh, symptoms of COVID-19, which would come to nobody's surprise. So for example, people that did get infected were more likely to be asymptomatic uh, than not. Uh, and that, again, there's some real world data emerging from Israel that demonstrates that. I think the other important point here too is there's data from uh, different sources that really demonstrate that if you are vaccinated and you are indeed infected and perhaps asymptomatic or very, very mildly symptomatic, well, posse symptomatic, your risk of transmitting to others is also lower. So there's emerging data from different vaccines and data from different sources to, to, to demonstrate that as well. That also comes kind of comes to no surprise. I mean, there there's pretty decent data uh, from the pre-vaccine era and in the early vaccine era demonstrating that, you know, of course, we know people can get this infection and have no symptoms, but truly people that have zero symptoms from the time they get infected to the time the virus leaves their body, they're actually not really responsible. The risk of, so let me rephrase it, the risk of transmission of those individuals is markedly, markedly lower compared to people that, that have symptoms. And there's some very good systematic reviews that have that have demonstrated that. Um, so I think when, you know, if the vaccine promotes uh, fewer symptoms, including asymptomatic infection or no infection, then, then it's pretty clear that that's gonna really promote less transmission among vaccinated individuals, even those who are unlucky enough to get the infection. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I'm wondering whether the vaccine itself triggers autoimmune reactions themselves, I think, um, can you answer that? Whether there's a vasculitis that the vaccine itself, I guess the, I'm not sure which vaccine she's referring to, but whether that's a, yeah. in the realm of possibility. Yeah, no, it, it sure is. And, and in fact, that's probably, again, a bit of speculation here. So please take this with a grain of salt, but that's probably driving the underlying pathology that leads to blood clotting in the AstraZeneca vaccine. Like it probably, again, got to be very careful with my words here. It, the very preliminary reports from, from Germany suggest that there may be some uh, autoimmune reaction or antibody mediated reaction that will trigger perhaps a hit heparin induced thrombocytopenia like scenario and and that's what's causing these pretty rare events. So mm -hmm. I think it's I think that's a very reasonable hypothesis. But again, it's still pretty early. We don't really know. And one more question is with regards to what we can expect in the next few months for immunized Canadians. Do is it what do any of our panelists see coming in terms of um, the kinds of increase of of being able to associate with other perhaps vaccinated folks? Um, people I know are thinking about concerts and other just kind of social events. And do you, do you, do you anticipate that there will be greater uh, freedom to do so? Or are we going to be likely living with the same kind of restrictions around masking and social distancing for the foreseeable future despite immunization? Who's going first? I'll, 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 jump, in, I'll jump in. Sure, um, go ahead. Bernie. I'm going to I'm going to not answer the question by saying I think we're going to see it um, in behavior first before there's a there's a policy change. Um, but it's a really good question, particularly with the extension to the four months. Uh, you know, I'm hearing people who have been in the early cohorts um, saying, oh, I'm, I'm immune now. And it's just even it's even jokingly. Um, so I, I'm imagining that as the age cohorts get lower, People are going to feel that that um, you know that invincibility back, and uh, even if the policy hasn't changed, we're going to see behavior change. And I don't know what that means towards our our um, you know developing third wave right now. And that's I think that's my concern is that people are feeling the freedom even though it's not there yet. I I would say that yeah I mean we you know eventually 
we're going to get back to these things. I just, I'm having a tough time guessing as to, you know, when that will be. Um, and I, I would agree that people are probably going to kind of come up with their own natural experiment in that. And, uh, and we're going to have to collect the real world data. Um, One question. Go ahead, Isaac. Oh yeah. I was going to say, I think we're, I mean, I think we're good. <laughs> I think we're going to be okay. I mean, obviously this third wave is very disturbing and, and there's definitely turbulent times on the horizon for many parts of the country. We just don't have this a degree of population level immunity that's going to protect us. We just don't. We, we just don't. Yep. We vaccinated our long-term care homes. Great. That's probably the most vulnerable of the vulnerable. Yep. Many places across the country have really targeted the 80 plus population or maybe working to their way down to the 70 plus population. But if you take a snapshot right now, today, we just don't have significant population level immunity, either from vaccination or from recovery of natural infection. And variant or not, this is a very transmissible infection. But on the other hand, like the pace of vaccination is picking up in Canada starting now, actually starting yesterday. Like we're getting a million doses of Pfizer delivered week after week after week. We're getting more AstraZeneca. We're getting more Moderna. Like our population level immunity is going to expand massively, massively, massively over the next month to two months. So, yeah, we're in the midst of a third wave in many parts of the country. Yep, yeah, it's going to it could get rough. And a lot of that just depends on our poli our politicians, our public health leaders and our own individual behavior. But like looking beyond that, I mean, that's March, April, maybe in May. But like looking beyond that in the midterm and long term, we're all going to get vaccinated. We're all going to be OK. And, and we will not flick a switch and end up in 2019 again. But we will be much, much, much closer to that end of the spectrum. And we'll be there probably pretty soon, like probably the tail end of the next two months. Like it's it's closer than we think. At the moment, though, we're not vaccinating children or adolescents, and I, I, I think, I guess, I'm wondering about whether we can achieve herd immunity as a population um, without immunizing that group. Which so that's a question, and also just where we stand at the moment with regards to the ability to offer vaccines to to kids over two, basically. Well, we we can't. I mean, we, but the clinical trials looking at those ten years and up are, are going to be available probably in the summer with conventional vaccines that we already have access to Pfizer and Moderna. Yeah. And then there's other clinical trials looking at those younger than, you know, younger than that six months to uh, 10 years, those clinical trials are, are going to be starting soon. But like, I don't think it's outlandish. I, again, it's hard. You never know what's that line about the hardest thing to predict is the future. <laughs> like, but I don't think it's outlandish to think that we'll have reasonable clinical trials by the summer telling us that, you know, we can vaccinate, 10, 11, 12 year olds up to 16. And I don't think it's outlandish that we start to do so, you know, by the tail end of the summer, or early into the school year. But I do agree with you, like, you know, we, we probably can achieve herd immunity uh, before all, all, all the kids, or at least very young kids plus are vaccinated. Having said that, when your hospitals are decompressed, when your vulnerable populations are vaccinated, when you are your ICUs are decompressed, when a significant proportion of your population is vaccinated, you know, it doesn't mean you go back to 2019, but it also doesn't mean you need to be locked down. I mean, I, so there is a, a massive gray area in the middle that will we'll be in there. And I think we'll be sort of closer to the 2019 end of the spectrum, but certainly not all the way there. Uh, one last question about overnight summer camps. Uh, I don't know, this is province by province, but uh, what is the guidance that anyone has heard so far for this summer in terms of oh. overnight camps? Do you realize how charged a question this is? I don't. I don't. Okay. But it like this it is. is like the lightning bolt of questions. That's why I'm going to defer to my esteemed colleagues. <laughs> Who may dodge it as well. And we'll, we'll ask our premiers, I guess, that question or our public health officers. Huh? Yeah, I, I don't I don't know what the policy is. It it does um I, I think there's some some concern I would have as a parent. Um but I don't I don't know what the policy is and the actual risk for that would be, but small area, you know, extended time. Okay. Well, fair enough. I won't press you on that. I know it's it is indeed a hot potato, especially for beleaguered parents that have been homeschooling for much of the winter, many of them. I do want to um, just move to, towards the end of our webinar, towards the end of our webinar now, just by sharing some information about 
resources that may be of interest to folks on our webinar today or watching it in recorded fashion. Um, Morgan Price has already referred to the COVID-19 immunization toolkit that's been prepared for primary care docs. And I think that was shared earlier in the chat, but I'll, I'll ask uh, Sam to put it up again. I uh, just highly recommend it as you're thinking about your own clinic or primary care network in terms of uh, how they're preparing. Um, the National Advisory Committee immunization recommendations were mentioned as well. That is obviously a key reference group for Canadians and for physicians around this. And there are recommendations most recently from March 16th, which is only a few, only a week ago, but again, those may be revised relatively frequently. This is a, a busy group of what I believe are volunteer doctors keeping an eye on this for us. Um, so there are the NASI guidelines that I'll um, just alert you to, and we'll put that in the chat as well. Two courses that I wanted just to let you know about. Uh, first of all, the CFPC has a free online COVID-19 course, uh, multi-module about managing COVID-19 from a variety of perspectives. And I wanted to um, invite you to do that course for main pro plus credits. It's uh, on our, uh, there'll be a link posted for that. And the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto has also collaborated with lots of leaders in this area and, and has a, like an online course around the vaccines in particular. That's um, a terrific course that uh, uh, um, was a rapid and very effective collaboration. So these are all, these are all resources available to you. As, as Morgan said earlier, it feels to me like the Globe and Mail in the morning and you know the news at night are, are important ways. Twitter all day are important sources of information as well. And I think like Morgan said, many of us are getting our information from the general media um, uh, just because you know, it's it's we're all we're all tuned in, and I do want to salute Isaac and so many other physicians that have been putting themselves out there on national media day after day, and um, really performing a remarkable public service in a very fast moving moving environment. And I know there's um, many other colleagues that are that have made themselves very available to media as well, and have really stepped up and showed the value of what physicians bring to um, to what we're facing right now. So. Thanks to Isaac and to all of you for that role, and obviously to all the panelists today um, for generously sharing of your time and answering those and many other questions that came in on the chat while we've been at it. Um, I'll just ask um, uh, for the last slide to go up, and I just want to let you know a little bit about the webinar still to come. We've got two coming up in April. I believe these are all on Tuesdays, Tuesday, April 20th, on top research studies for family docs from 2020. Um, and that's going to be in English a week later in French with Mike and Nick. And on May 18th, we've got a, a criminal webinar series on CHF and primary care because it can't be COVID-19 all the time after all. Other things are happening and we're well aware of the deficit of care that's being created around all of our necessary mobilization on COVID-19. So with that, I'm going to draw our webinar to a close. Thanks very much to Isaac, to Jen, to Morgan for your generous sharing of information and experience. Really appreciate it. Thanks to everyone who's tuned in now. And just a reminder, if you're claiming, if you're watching this live right now, you can claim those main pool plus credits by clicking on the link and you've got until Friday. And if you join CFPC Learn, which is our new online learning portal, you can claim main pool plus credits there for the recorded version of these webinars, which we know that three or 4,000 of our members will watch each time. So please visit our website, cfpclearn.ca and check it out there. So with that, thanks to the panelists. Thanks to everyone who made uh, this webinar possible today behind the scenes. And we'll look forward to seeing you uh, next time around for our Practical Talks for Family Docs webinar series. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.